Clouds of fire and smoke fly upward, and the rocket launches. The Delta IV Heavy is one of the most powerful rockets people have ever made. Three massive engines burn tons of fuel, helping the spacecraft gain altitude. The two side boosters undock, leaving the common booster core for further ascent. When in orbit, the rocket releases its payload. This is the Parker Solar Probe, the first spacecraft to touch the sun. And we'll follow its journey step by step. The probe was launched on August 12, 2018, and began its journey toward our star. The sun is 93 million miles away from Earth. That's 390 times the Earth-Moon distance and 36,000 times the width of the United States from coast to coast. The particles of light that the sun emits need eight minutes to travel this distance. For our conventional rockets, that journey would take more than 200 days. But the Parker Solar Probe covered it faster using gravitational maneuvers. On its way from the Earth to the sun, the probe circled around our neighbor, Venus. All it had to do was enter the planet's gravitational field and let it attract itself. At this point, our space probe got an extra boost, and it didn't need to waste any fuel. After making one orbit, the space probe's engines changed the trajectory, and the probe left the orbit of Venus. It got enough acceleration to travel to the sun. And on November 5, 2018, the Parker Solar Probe made its first approach to the sun. Before touching its surface, the spacecraft had to enter the star's orbit first. To achieve this, it did even more gravitational maneuvers. Only after that did it start circling the sun, the heaviest object in the solar system with the most powerful gravity. So, it'll give the probe an incredible amount of acceleration with each flyby. The Parker Solar Probe was constantly moving between two points. Those were the perihelion and aphelion. Look, here's the sun, and here's the probe's orbit in the shape of an ellipse. The closest point to the sun is the perihelion. The sun was pulling the probe there at an incredible speed. At this point, the probe began to move away from the star. It still had a lot of speed and energy, but it was struggling against the gravitational force of the star. So it gradually slowed down. The point where the probe lost all its acceleration is called aphelion. The star's gravitational force won, and the probe began to move back toward the sun, picking up speed again. The probe made several circles following a stable orbit, but then its orbit intersected with that of Venus again. Another gravitational maneuver, and after that, the Parker Solar Probe's trajectory shifted slightly, and it gained more speed. The perihelion point of its orbit was now closer to the sun. The probe made several more circles following this new orbit. Then again, it neared Venus. Another approach to the sun. Each encounter with Venus corrected the probe's trajectory and gradually reduced its distance from our star. In April 2021, the Parker Solar Probe finally came so close to the sun that it touched its corona. Although the actual distance between the probe and the sun was 5.3 million miles, that still counted as a touch. Let's look at the structure of our star by cutting it in half. This is the core of the sun. It's about a quarter of its width. The core is 150 times as dense as water. Because of the intense pressure and high temperature, nuclear reactions occur there. Hydrogen gets converted into helium, giving off an incredible amount of heat and radiation. The next layer is the radiation zone. This is where the heat is transferred from the core to the next layers. But the photons here don't move in an outward direction. They can be directed anywhere and re-radiated many times. Scientists believe that the average time it takes a photon of light to travel from the core to the next layer of the sun is about 10,000 to 170,000 years. Then there's the convection zone. This is what's considered to be the surface of the sun. But it's not a solid surface. It's an ocean of hot plasma. It looks like a bee honeycomb. That's because the heated plasma rises from the lower layers, creating something like mini geysers. And while it's still hot in the middle of those geysers, their edges cool down, creating an amazing pattern on the sun's surface. The next layers are the sun's atmosphere. First, the photosphere. This is the layer that gives off light. And that's exactly what you see when you look at the sun. But careful, don't do that. You need special equipment to look at our star. The photosphere is up to 250 miles thick. This is about the height at which the International Space Station moves above Earth. Then, the chromosphere, or the sphere of color. This layer of the sun's atmosphere gives the star its reddish hue. Solar prominences appear here. 
Those are powerful emissions of matter leaving the surface of the sun. Their speed can reach 430 miles per second. At some point, they get caught by the star's magnetic field and pulled back. And then there's the corona, a gaseous envelope of the sun. The most powerful ejections take place there. You can see the corona during eclipses, when the moon covers the solar disk. Then you can notice some kind of glow around the star. This is the corona. It extends for millions of miles around the sun. And the Parker Solar Probe touched precisely that area. That's where solar material and radiation are still tied to the star's gravity and don't fly off into space. And all that is beyond that area is the solar wind. It's the material and radiation that managed to escape the sun's gravity and set off into space. The Parker Solar Probe surprised astronomers by providing more information about this boundary. It turns out it's not a perfect circular wall like we used to think. The boundary is broken and uneven. It looks more like a mountain range. These bumpy regions have such a shape because of the uneven flow of plasma from the surface of the sun. The larger and more powerful the flow, the farther the boundary is from the star's surface. But scientists don't know yet what exactly causes this difference. After making the flyby around the sun, the Parker Solar Probe continued its journey and started to move away from the star again. Researchers are expecting another four approaches in 2022. In August 2023, the probe will make a flyby around Venus. It'll gain more speed and approach the sun at a record close distance. The next Venus flyby will happen in 2024. And hopefully, the Parker Solar Probe will be able to withstand the high temperatures and radiation so close to the sun. Luckily, scientists have taken care of that. The probe has a solar shield. It's attached to the side of the probe that will face the star. It's about the size of a house window and about four and a half inches thick. It's made of a special material that can withstand a temperature of about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That's almost six times higher than the temperature of a regular kitchen oven. The body of the probe is made of a white material that reflects sunlight. All the scientific equipment is placed right in the center of the shadow of this shield. If the sun's rays hit the unprotected body of the probe at close range, all the equipment will be out of action in just a few tenths of a second. The Parker Solar Probe is equipped with the Electromagnetic Fields Investigation Instrument. This is a system for measuring electric and magnetic fields, radio waves, temperature, and plasma density. The Wide Field Imager for the Parker Solar Probe, or WISPER, is an optical telescope, the one that took those stunning images of the moving plasma in the sun's corona. These streamers are what you see during solar eclipses. The Solar Wind Electrons, Alphas, and Protons investigation measures protons, electrons, and helium ions. It helps scientists study solar winds. It often harms our technology. Unexpected flares on the surface of the sun can cause severe solar winds. They can burn chips and satellites orbiting Earth. Given that we have the ISS, where people work all the time, we need to know more about solar winds and how to protect ourselves from them. While the Parker Solar Probe continues its research, it's already set several world records. It's the closest to the sun human-made object. It's also the speed record holder. During its final approach to the sun, the probe reached a speed of 101 miles per second. That means it could cover the distance from New York to Los Angeles in just 24 seconds. And a trip around Earth would take about four minutes. A journey to the moon in such a spacecraft would only take 40 minutes. In 2025, the Parker Solar Probe will make its closest approach to the sun reaching a speed of about 430,000 miles per hour. But even this speed is only 0.064% of the speed of light. You may think the Earth is pretty big, but the Sun makes up almost 99.9% .9 of the mass of the whole solar system. The rest of the mass is made up by the planets and their satellites, asteroids, comets, gas, and dust. It's around 93 million miles away from our planet but it keeps us warm every day. Its temperature is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the space surrounding it is still cold as ice. To understand this, we need to distinguish between heat and temperature. Heat is the energy inside some object. Temperature is something that tells us if that object is hot or cold. When the heat is transferred to that object, it makes its temperature go up. When the object is losing heat, the temperature goes down. Heat can be transferred in three different ways. The sun does it through radiation. 
That means it's releasing heat in the form of light. Your body radiates heat too, as infrared waves. That's why thermal imaging cameras will detect that you're in the room even at night. The hotter the object, the more heat it will radiate. The temperature only affects matter. Since space is mostly a vacuum, it doesn't have enough particles for heat to transfer in any other way than through radiation. When the heat from the sun gets to an object, the atoms start absorbing energy, but the heat can't transfer since there is no matter in space. Those rare atoms and molecules in space will absorb the heat. And they'll simply stay that way, while the cold vacuum will stay cold. There's a lot of matter inside Earth's atmosphere, so the energy of the sun can transfer easily. But if you put an object outside of the Earth's atmosphere in direct sunlight, it would end up heated to 250 degrees Fahrenheit because it's matter made of atoms and molecules. The temperature of the vacuum is negative 454 degrees Fahrenheit. That means, depending on where you are, space can either burn or freeze you. The sun isn't actually yellow. It emits light over a wide range of wavelengths. We can tell both its temperature and color by the peak in its spectrum. For instance, cooler stars will appear red, and hotter stars will be blue with yellow, orange, and white stars in between. When it comes to the sun, the spectrum peaks at a wavelength we'd usually call green, but our eye perceives it differently. So, the shade of green in combination with other wavelengths from the spectrum is going to look white to the human eye. We generally see the sun as yellow because our atmosphere scatters blue light more efficiently than the red one. During sunrise and sunset, there's more red light in the spectrum of the sun, which gives us amazing sceneries. Sunspots are part of the sun's visible surface that are on average way cooler than the sun itself. They overlap with parts that have an increased magnetic field. These parts don't allow the release of heat to the sun's visible surface. That way, the rest of the sun's surface is three times brighter than those sunspots. That contrast makes them appear almost black. If we could take a sunspot apart from the sun and place it somewhere in the night sky, it would be different, as bright as the moon when we see it from the Earth. All the planets in our solar system spin in the same direction because they were formed from one protoplanetary cloud, except for Uranus and Venus. They have probably had some strong impact on them that made them spin in the opposite direction. But it's different with galaxies. They don't usually form the same cloud of dust and particles. Also, they're not randomly distributed across space. They come in filaments, dense, slender strands of dark matter and galaxies, with voids in between. Proto-galaxies are linked by gravitational forces in small areas of space. This is probably because of the distribution of dark matter throughout the universe. The matter in the filaments moves in a corkscrew motion and goes towards the densest area. So, there might be a common direction galaxies tend to spin, but it's mostly random. There's a possibility we'll see a lunar elevator one day. Yep, a cable anchored to the surface of the moon. It would stretch 250,000 miles. We wouldn't be able to directly attach it to our planet because both Earth and the moon are moving. But we could keep it terminated high in our planet's orbit. Some researchers believe we could build such an elevator for a few billion dollars. The moon has resources we could definitely use. A rare form of helium found there could be of use in fusion power stations on our planet. Also, we could take some other rare elements and use them in smartphones and the rest of electronics. So, after around 53 trips up and down, the elevator could pay for itself. The cable would be as thick as a pencil, but its weight would be around 40 tons. It could even be made of materials we already have here on Earth with no need to invent something. There could even be a combination of two elevators. A spacecraft would winch up an elevator from the surface of our planet to a space station. Then it would be flung towards the moon. There would be another elevator to finally lower it down to the surface of the moon. Planets in our solar system have predictable and stable orbits. But gas giant collisions could have happened at an early stage when a planetary system was still forming. In case of a head-on collision, two gas giants would merge 
they wouldn't end up losing their mass, the materials in their gaseous envelopes, or the ones in their solid cores. Such a collision at a higher speed would cause the loss of the major part of the envelope gas, and very high speeds, boom, both planets are gone. It's different if it's not a head-on collision. If two cores manage to completely avoid each other, gas giants won't merge, but they'll lose some of the mass. Gas giants might even change their shape due to such collisions. Astronomers found out there's a galaxy extremely far away from us that looks similar to our Milky Way. We now see it as it was when the universe was only 1.4 billion years old, and now it's 13.8 billion years old. It took over 12 billion years for the light to come from this faraway galaxy and reach our planet. This galaxy is peaceful, stable, and surprisingly non-chaotic, unlike all other galaxies that were quite turbulent in their early stages. To leave the Milky Way, we'd have to travel around 25,000 light-years away from the center of the galaxy, or 500 light-years vertically. Our galaxy is a disk of stars that spreads around 100,000 light-years across and is 1,000 light-years thick. The Sun, its central star, is located halfway from the center of the galaxy and close to the middle of the disk in the vertical direction. We'd have to go further than its edge to get away from the halo that surrounds the Milky Way, old stars, diffuse gas, and globular clusters. If you wanted to go even further to see the Milky Way in all its glory, you'd have to travel 48,000 light-years vertically. At this moment, we don't even have a telescope we can send there. There are central stars that eat planets. Our solar system is stable, unlike many other planetary systems. So we don't have to be afraid the Earth or some other planet will change its orbit and go towards the Sun. But at least a quarter of other planetary systems with orbiting stars similar to the Sun have a pretty chaotic past. In some of them, there are planets that used to move around, and their unpredictable migrations have disrupted the paths of some other planets, or even pushed them outside of their orbit. That means some planets probably have fallen into the central star. When that happens, the planet gets dissolved in the outer layer of the star, which means it gets eaten. Now really, an object weighing billions of times the mass of our sun must be easy to find, right? Wrong. Unfortunately, it might not be that simple, like in the case with a missing black hole. But let's travel to the galaxy cluster Abel 2261, hosting a supermassive black hole at its center. Or at least, that's where it's supposed to be. The main problem is this giant space phenomenon is nowhere to be found. Now, supermassive black holes are mega-monsters, churning slowly at the center of their home galaxies. They gather tremendous clouds of gas and dust around them, which makes them swell up to sizes the human mind can't begin to imagine. If a supermassive black hole, like the one that dwells at the center of our home Milky Way galaxy, moved even a little bit closer to our solar system, we'd be doomed. The distance between this huge thing and Earth could be several dozens of light years, and still, it would wreak havoc on our planet. Earth, along with other things making up the solar system, would be tugged into the black hole's orbit and doomed to spin around it for eternity or longer. Hey, who knows, right? So, it's good that such black holes stay away from us at the moment. So, let's see what happened to that runaway supermassive black hole from that gigantic cluster of galaxies around 2.7 billion years away from our planet. Scientists have been looking for it with the help of NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory and Hubble Space Telescope. But so far, no result. The main problem with finding a black hole is that it's, uh, well, black. And space is, you guessed it, black too. So there's no contrast whatsoever that could help astronomers spot the hole. But scientists haven't given up yet. After all, they have a lot of other technologies to find black holes, small and big, in the vastness of space. Some of these methods involve watching the stars orbiting black holes. Sometimes, it's a faint gravitational wave signal which is produced when two black holes collide. But the most reliable technique is watching dust and gas falling to their doom. The thing is, black holes are space objects with insane gravity. So regions of space surrounding them are usually a bit chaotic, 
gas and dust getting pulled into the bottomless abyss, compressing and heating up. In the process, it releases a flood of X-ray radiation. So, astronomers look for extremely bright X-ray sources in the universe. Chances are, those are the last gasps of giant clumps of material before they disappear into a black hole. Then, why can't scientists find such X-ray signatures left by the black hole in Abel 2261? One of the most mysterious things about its disappearance is that radio telescopes have spotted some signs of massive plumes of superheated material launched at one point within the last 50 million years. These plumes were most likely caused by a large black hole, which is nowhere to be found these days. So, at the moment, we can only play a guessing game. Maybe two medium-sized black holes collided, pushing the newly merged giant out of the center of the galaxy. The observations of the stars in that galaxy have shown a clump of dense material a few thousand light-years away from the galaxy's core. Maybe it's the runaway black hole. But disappointingly, no X-ray signals are coming from that clump. Or the hole might still be there in its rightful place. But it's, you know, slumbering. If it doesn't get a fresh supply of gas and dust, it has nothing to feed on. As a result, it can't release a flood of X-rays. But again, the answer, do not disturb, the black hole is sleeping now, isn't very satisfying. Why isn't it getting its space food? What happened 50 million years ago? What is that clump of material speeding away from the galaxy center? So many questions, and no answers so far. At least, we know what black holes look like. Well, kinda. It's actually the shadow of a black hole's event horizon, visible against the glowing superheated material falling inside the hole. The first ever mugshot of a black hole appeared in 2019. But the data for its creation was collected in 2017. It took an international team, consisting of more than 200 astronomers, two years to assemble the image. We can admire this amazing space phenomenon thanks to a vast global network of telescopes called the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, or simply EHT. Why such a name? The thing is that the event horizon is a point of no return on the outskirts of a black hole. When something, for example, matter, radiation, or light, reaches this boundary, there is no way for it to escape the black hole's clutches. Anyway, to capture that very first image of a black hole, scientists created a virtual telescope that turned out as big as our planet by combining the power of eight powerful radio telescopes. But it wasn't an easy feat the researchers had to simultaneously point the telescopes in a meticulously planned order with the help of precise atomic clocks set on each telescope. Plus, to keep the chances of rain and bad weather to a minimum, they even constructed the telescopes in super dry regions, such as the Atacama Desert in Chile and the South Pole. On each observation day, the telescope gathers roughly 350 terabytes of data. That's 10 times the amount of data collected every day at the Large Hadron Collider. But let's speak more about black holes themselves. There are stellar black holes, smaller but even more dangerous than their supermassive peers. They appear when stars that have run out of their star food fall into themselves. If a star used to be big enough, it keeps compressing and compressing some more, and voila! A baby stellar black hole is born. But even if I call such a hole a small one, it's still five to several tens of times heavier than the Sun. Unlike their massive siblings, hypothetical mini black holes could be really tiny, not bigger than an atom. Even so, just one minuscule thing would have the mass of a thousand SUVs. One theory claims tons of micro black holes could have been created right after the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe. Some scientists even go as far as to say that a couple mini black holes pass through our planet every day. There is a supermassive black hole smack dab in the middle of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Its name is Sagittarius A star, and it's 4.3 million times as heavy as the Sun. And nope, we aren't going to be pulled into this hole. It's more than 26,000 light years from Earth, too far to have any influence on our planet. By the way, recently, astronomers have discovered that this supermassive black hole might be leaking. If it's true, it probably means that Sagittarius A star isn't a sleeping giant, as previously thought. 
it might still be active. And the leakage recorded by scientists may be the whole hiccuping while swallowing clouds of gas. Maybe we should burp this baby? If you ever find yourself near a black hole, hmm, get ready that time will significantly slow down. It may work for you if you aren't eager to grow older. Just don't let yourself be tugged beyond the point of no return. Another danger of hanging around a black hole is that it might start behaving like a massive galactic volcano. From time to time, black holes flare up, but instead of spewing lava, they produce enormous amounts of energy, and it makes gaping holes in the surrounding material and gas. A short time ago, scientists discovered one of the largest craters in the universe. Radio and X-ray telescopes detected a supermassive black hole that threw a temper tantrum many, many years ago. It happened in a galaxy cluster about 390 million light-years away from Earth. The crater left behind, which was actually a hole punched in the cluster's hot gas, could fit 15 Milky Way galaxies. Okay, mind blown, I'm out of here. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.